What's happening? What's happening? What's happening, blues people? Yes, I know you're used to hearing that on the Jack Dapper Blues podcast. Guess what? Remember, Jack Dapper Blues Heritage Preservation Foundation is the parent company. That is the foundation of all the works that we do. And because we're heavy into uh, public media, Jack Dapper Blues Radio is still in existence and it focuses more on the musical aspect um, or musicianship as well of our heritage, history, and tradition. And the African American Folklorist, which is a newspaper, this is the first issue, the second issue will be out in, for December, is our more ethnographic and folkloric work. Ethnomusicology is part of it. So they're, they're kind of, they're, they're synonymous, they're one and the same, but they, they feature, at least we, we, we work to have them feature specific things that are slightly different. And with that being said, we're going to um, be pulling a raffle soon. We have mouse pads, if you still have a desktop. We have sweatshirts, hoodies, t-shirts. You can also buy it. And we have mugs. More than that, but these are some of the things that we're raffling off now. And speaking of mugs, what I'm drinking is a skinny brew. Now, I can't do as much justice to the description as my wife, Denise Pearlie, because these are her products that she sells. You can get them in a pack, Skinny Brew. If you have issues sleeping, Sleepy Tea. If you're a juicer, but you may not have the time to do the process of juicing, there's just celery, right? And then if you just need a shot of energy and you are not a coffee drinker, see that energy. And you can also get them sample packs packs of three in the description we will have all that information and how you can contact uh, Mrs. Pearlie to get these great products which we actually use with that being said oh you like my hat Blues Music Magazine I write for them as well very very uh, it's, a, it's a great a uh, 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 publication of the blues scene currently. Uh, one of the most uh, notable, right, and integrity-driven blues magazines. Now, with that being said, let's get to my wonderful guest, a recurring guest at that, uh, Mr. Tyler Perry. Let me just read this off before we bring him on because we're going to talk about his book that is currently out and available for sale and he was a guest on our show some time ago when we discussed this um phenomena uh this tradition uh this heritage so i'm going to read this off in this definitive history of a unique tradition tyler d parry untangles the convoluted history of the broomstick wedding popularity associated with african-american culture parry traces the rituals origins to marginalized groups in the british isles and explores how it influenced the marriage traditions of different communities on both sides of the atlantic ocean his surprising findings shed new light on the complexities of cultural exchange between peoples of African and European descent from the 1700s up to the 20th century. So let's bring my noted guest in. What's happening, sir? Doing really well. How are you doing? It's good to be back. Yes, it's great to have you back. We, we you know, I'm still, you know, I, I, I I'm still. Um, excited about the uh, uh, hellhounds and the slave hounds, but that's that's another. We'll talk about that another time. Uh, yeah, yeah, another episode for sure. <laughs> so let's let's get into this book uh, for several reasons, and I have some questions too because I, I've I've come across some 
information that may be new to people. I know it was slightly new to me. So I'm really interested. Uh, talk to us about the book. Give, give, give us a breakdown of it and then go right into your inspiration. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as the book's structure and its format, it was designed to be the broadest possible analysis of the broomstick wedding to date. So that essentially means that I'm looking at its origins and as far as recorded history, about 18th century British Isles, as far back as I could go, there's some folklore about it happening earlier, but at the same time, like the first documented references are around the mid to late 18th century. And then I follow it across the Atlantic with um, the migration from the British Isles, uh, looking at how it was adapted and adopted amongst enslaved people within the antebellum South in the 19th century. And then broadening that out to look at how it was also used amongst European American populations, uh, poor and common white communities throughout the South, as well as in the North and the American West as well. And then I become interested in what happens after 1865. What do the formerly enslaved do with the ritual, if anything at all? What are their thoughts about it? And then if it goes away, which it does for about a century, why is it revived in the mid to the late 20th century? And then particularly a moment in the late 1980s and early 1990s where you see more or less just a relative explosion of interest within the ritual, particularly amongst African Americans, uh, through a paradigm that we can call heritage wedding, which we can talk about much more a little bit later in the show. And then I look at its appeal to even broader populations. I look at some people in the Caribbean starting to do it, um, advocates for same-sex marriage and kind of the racial politics that occur within that movement. And then I postulate um, what it means to interracial couples as well as writing a conclusion as to where I think the ritual is going in the future. And, you know, historians are not very good at predicting the future, only the past. But um, I do try to draw out some ideas about what I think might happen to the ritual going forward. And so I'm sorry, oh, yeah. I, I want to jump in there because that was quite, um, that was intriguing because it's, it's uh, different, right? Because most um, takes on history, um, not usual to, to, to give a prediction, uh, even, well, yeah, I don't even think in, in, in folkloric or ethnographic work there's really predictions. What what um what inspired you to 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 give it to look at it in the future as if as is where where it's going, how where it's heading? Yeah, I think I was just fascinated by how much the ritual and its meaning has changed over time. And so originally I was just going to write a book where I looked at the ritual up to 1865 and then made some kind of like an epilogue about how it was lost to the community for a while before it was revived. But that was only supposed to be a short piece. But I was very inspired and motivated by how relevant the custom continue to be, particularly after it was revived after the 1970s. And so as I saw it being referenced in popular culture much more often in the 21st century, but then the challenges to it in forums and blog posts amongst people who believed it was a vestige of the past, you know, I don't use the term history repeats itself because I think that's um, a bit too simplistic. But there does seem to be some repetition in how people embrace, reject, re-embrace, and then reject again ritual practices associated with one's ancestors. So I think that I just wanted to take the book up as far as I possibly could because I know that so many people remain attached to it. And this can be maybe a motivating factor for people to reinvestigate their assumptions about the ritual and try to understand it on, in both its historical context, but also on the terms of the people who used it in the past. So let's, let's jump to the past, because the, the irony <laughs> is I received a DM message today <laughs> 
and it's extreme. It's, it's an extreme um, um, act of irony because the person who sent it to me had no clue you and I were uh, interviewing today or discussing this, mm-hmm. and and I. It when it hit me, it was like a ton of bricks because I, I think it's 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 very pertinent to this conversation because you you, you find you track this um, tradition to uh, the British Isles to Europe and let me just read this off to you first and then we can dissect it but dissect dissect it as it relates to the book. And I make that clear because <laughs> it's, 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 I don't want to say it's new information to me, but that's not what we're talking about. So I'm not trying to bring you out the comfort zone because I didn't forewarn you about this. <laughs> that's okay. No so um, a book by Oliver Cromwell, and it has a picture. I'll show you guys the picture of Scottish coats of arms. So what it says is, this is the part I'm going to read. These black Europeans were sent to Barbados, Boston, Charlestown, Cambridge, Concord, uh, Hingham, I can't read the other one, Virginia and Newark, and the Southern Plantations. These are the facts, ladies and gentlemen. These Scottish blacks are among us in the Americas, and we are ignorant of their existence as well as they are. So the, what, what I received by that, as well as other pieces of information, we know about the Moors, about Rome and different things like this. They, there, was a, a, there was a black population in these, or a melanated population in, in, in these regions well before, you know, the 1700s or what have you. So considering that this was a tradition that here in America be, became uh, immediately, well, if not immediately, popularly incorporated into black tradition, could it be that those in the British Isle and in that region of Europe were actually black that was practicing this and brought it as as in their servitude so when it comes to folklore i don't eliminate any possibility so but the only issue i take with it being transferred from black populations in britain that migrated to the caribbean or uh, north america or south america is that there's a couple of different things and so i didn't write about this particular aspect in the book very much but it is in my dissertation for those who want to access it is that I actually wrote an entire chapter in my dissertation on West African marriage rituals. And one of the motivating factors for doing that when I was studying diasporic wedding rituals was to see if I could find any evidence of a broomstick tradition existing within Western Africa or Atlantic Africa, broadly conceived. And I didn't find anything. I mean, much of it followed kind of a structured aspect of Courtship, where the man approached the woman's parents, offered a what was usually called a bride wealth, goods in exchange for her, which gives an insurance policy in case there's a marital disruption that requires separation. And then they exchange different goods. There might be some ceremonies that take place, but nothing involving broomsticks. And then the second aspect of this that causes me to question you know, if it has these ancient African roots that, that some people have proposed it, is that you only really find it in the United States during slavery with the exception of Bermuda. So if it was done by people of African descent in other areas of the Americas, it's simply unrecorded. I haven't found it. And I've looked at archives in Jamaica, which is also an Anglophone colony within the British Empire that had a very large African population, particularly directly from Africa as well, which would have been important for cultural transfer. So it's what seems to occur is that the only populations that I really find it, at least amongst black populations occurring within, are populations that had some significant exchange with the Euro-American populations that surrounded them. 
So Bermuda does make sense within that case because there was roughly half and half split between the black and white population. Many of the black people in Bermuda were born in Bermuda by the mid 18th century and similar statistics within the United States with the exception that um, populations of African descent were a minority throughout the South. Majority in certain areas, but a minority overall. So what seems to occur is that there is a direct link to the British aspect of this. And so by process of elimination, I have to assume that it was something introduced by what we would call white British populations, uh, particularly in the United States and Bermuda. Though I, I leave the possibility that black people that lived throughout the British Isles may have done it too. It's just I have no documentation to prove it. Well, you know... Yet again, <laughs> you touch on something that we can unpack here because we, we're also talking about a, a place that had a, a, a rule on a large portion of the world, which was Britain. So uh, share with us how their influence and power a, a, across the world um, may and and slavery, for that matter, may have uh, contributed to the, the, the carrying along and transferring of this particular tradition? Yeah, so certainly that's an interesting question, and it's something that I've wanted to investigate a little bit more if and when I have the time on subsequent pro projects. But I have no doubt that the broomstick marriage tradition probably spans multiple continents that were colonized by the British. It's just that the largest documentation we have does exist within the United States. And part of that is because of federal programs and initiatives in which rural people's life stories were recorded by writers who were employed by the federal government, the uh, Works Progress Administration being the most prominent case, particularly when talking about formerly enslaved people. But if you go to Australia, uh, you have traditions of broomstick marriages taking place there, though they're not as prominently documented in the colonial period as they are within the United States. Um, but the, the British influence as far as their span throughout the transoceanic empire that they created certainly has influences upon the cultural adaptations and exchanges that occur within all of the colonies which they held but the contention here for particularly enslaved people in the United States is under what terms do they adopt said rituals and how do they adapt them to make them uniquely their own within the culture? And so the, the broad argument I should say is I am less interested in who begins the ritual first. I'm more interested in what they do with it once they acquire it. So let's talk about that, because what, what what I'm receiving, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the Americas is where you you found it, it was utilized, um, I guess, um, the most, right? So, so, right. so, so, you, how, I guess the question would be, how was it introduced, if you were able to find that out? And then let's, let's go into how it spread it through these, these uh, plantations and things of this nature. Sure. This is a good question. So this was actually probably the biggest discovery I made in this project a few years ago. Um, when I was, because the, the ultimate criticism I would always get as a historian who is using folkloric sources is, well, when does the transfer happen, right? What is the origin point? You know, you have to start from this date to this date. And that was always very difficult because when dealing with the broomstick marriage, which is largely occurring amongst populations that didn't write their own histories, I have no idea who the first person to do it was. And so I, I eventually determined that even if I never found that crucial piece of information, I still thought there was viability to the project simply because we're talking about a cultural expression that has held such significant impact amongst all of the populations that have used it. So to get to your point more specifically, there was a source that interestingly enough, I just kind of haphazardly found 
one of those days when I was just perusing the book stacks in the library, similar to my bookshelf on the back that you see here, I was just kind of wandering my university's library one day, and I started looking at dictionaries of U European folklore, just out of nowhere. I just ha stumbled upon the section, found the dustiest one that sat on the shelf, and just started looking things up. And I turned to a page that featured broomsticks. And, you know, back then, they would give you, like, little examples and dates and references from books. And I found one that referenced the 18th century as a source. And I thought that was strange because I hadn't found a lot of discussion for the 18th century up to that point. So I cross-referenced the source, found it, and eventually ordered it through an interlibrary loan program to where it was delivered to me in a couple of weeks. And what it happened to be was a novel written by a Welsh sailor. So it wasn't an autobiography, but it was a novel that was what scholars suggest was partially based upon his life. And one thing that it says within the novel, which I doing kind of some addition and subtraction I discovered was written at least in the start about the 1760s, the 1770s. And he mentions this moment where the titular character called Llewellyn Penrose, who was listed as a Welshman, a Welsh sailor, basically crash lands on what we now call Central America and becomes integrated within this group that comprises indigenous and African populations that live there together, which was not at all uncommon um, when talking about some of these early eras of the, both the slave trade, but also just oceanic migration at this point. So one thing he does is he introduces this broomstick marriage to this local community. And as a Welshman, he directly says, this is what my people do when they have a mind to get married. And I was just floored by this source. I'm like, okay, this is a novel, but it's a primary source that provides at least a framework for understanding the possible ways under which this ritual was spread from one side of the ocean to the other amongst a group that had no, at least at that point, ancestral connection to the ritual. And so that at least provided a piece of the puzzle that then allowed me to jump in to do this comparative analysis to where I'm trying to, in absence of you know, evidence of actual contact between people when they were getting married, to compare the way in which they utilize these rituals. So what similarities and differences could I find? Were there similarities in the way that Welsh populations or Romani populations practiced the ritual when compared to enslaved populations within the U.S. South? And what I found is that you can actually see a number of distinct similarities amongst certain groups. So both the Welsh and African-Americans jumped backwards when they wanted to initiate a divorce. And so I had started to suggest that there seems to have been some influence culturally within that dynamic. Um, it was also known to occur that some people placed the broomstick uh, in front of their doorway and jumped over it that way. And this was relatively universal amongst many populations. It happened within North Wales. It happened amongst white Appalachian communities. And it happened amongst some enslaved people on certain uh, plantations. So all of this to say, um, there are distinctions locally. So it's hard for me to make any broad generalizations as to how people practiced it. And that's actually really fascinating because it suggests that they adapted it to their own unique circumstances. But the universal trait, of course, that seems to be occurring is that everybody did some form of leap or step over the broomstick. And they all denoted that that confirmed the marriage amongst their own individual communities. So... What I, as what I essentially argue within the first couple of chapters in particular are these moments where I'm seeing similarities and divergences between the many populations that used it, but how this information informs us to the ways in which cultures adopt and adapt to their circumstances and acquire rituals, uh, maybe even if not initially on their own terms, they certainly signify them on their own terms later across generations. Let me jump in here because there, there's 
Well, I, I would like to be clear on something. Uh, you said the Walsh or Welsh community, did, did I say it right? Yeah, Welsh. Welsh. Okay. The reason why I, I, I'm, I'm making this distinction is because the Appalachian uh, community, the, the, the Southern Black community, these were uh, working low to no income people. That's how we would uh, classify it today, right? Yes. So with, with that being said, is there a, a class uh, different in utilizing this particular ritual, right? Because where it's where, where I'm receiving, it it was utilized that they they weren't the quote unquote well to do or aristocratic community, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because the unifying feature. Um, that I argue within the group. Wedding. And the reason why I think it's important is because this book isn't just about a wedding ritual. That's kind of the, the primary reference point, but it's really about the people who used it, particularly as a way to kind of subvert the oppression that's being placed upon them by the aristocratic or so-called elite classes. So when you look at those who used it, marginalized Celtic populations, British laborers or English laborers, gypsy communities, enslaved people, Appalachians, Cajuns, mining communities in the American West. And then later on in the um, 20th century, same sex couples who are seeking marital equality. All of these populations are viewing the broomstick ritual at some point in their history as a ritual that relates to their experiences as being under the oppressive forces of an inequitable state or co colonial force. So the one, one thing I argue as to why it may have been attractive to enslaved people, at least at some point after its adoption, is because, and that also enslaved people are unique with this entire history because they are the only population that cannot legally obtain um, the marriage contract. Right? Their marriages are not recognized by the state, whereas theoretically Romani populations could have probably registered their marriages with the state and other populations as well. So there's different circumstances, but the similarity here is that it provides communal endorsements when the state withholds endorsements from the marginalized group of people. And particularly thinking that if you are a young couple who is eager to get married, you know that you're in love and you know that this is the one for you, but you hear that a minister is not going to come to your area within three to six months, as often happened within the 18th and 19th centuries, you are going to determine that com the communal endorsement is more important than the ecclesiastical one. Now, of course, the promise is that eventually, if you are a Christian, you'll eventually get married in front of a priest. But we also see the broomstick marriage becoming a stand-in for couples that didn't want to wait for the next minister to possibly stroll through their town or their area. And so as long as the community confirmed it for you, you were surrounded by your friends and you performed the ritual, that was enough. Uh, to allow you to initiate and begin your marital life. It, it was what the community determined that was most important to you. The same thing goes for enslaved people. They knew that at any moment their families could be separated, but they still took the ritual seriously. And they still viewed themselves, and this is um, bolstered by testimonials that happened decades afterward, they still saw, at least many of them, saw their broomstick marriages as just as good and just as valid as any state piece of paper that was given to them by the federal or the state governments. So for me, I, I largely see this as kind of a Marxist analysis of marriage traditions amongst the most marginalized and impoverished and oppressed populations throughout this, what you might call the North British Atlantic. So, it is ironic. I mean, this word is going to be used all night, apparently. <laughs> but you, you say Marxist because based on your description and explanation, and I don't know if you see me doing this. I'm jotting down uh, a little side note so I won't forget because you're saying a lot of good things. That it, Some of these things that we I would like to unpack, as you know. It, it sounds like this particular uh, ritual, 
is a form of revolution or resistance. Is that safe to say? Yes, I think in, in many cases it certainly is classified as resistance. So how, now, because you, you also mentioned this, and thinking about at least the, I, I can't say all, but the popular narrative of um, Southern Blacks or, or, or plantation folk and things of this nature is their deep-rooted belief in 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 the cloth, right? Uh, Christianity, uh, Hebrewism, how you know, however you want to term it. Um, we also know there were a lot of uh, those that were secular, which is where uh, the term "slave secular" as a music comes from. Um, how you you mentioned that they utilized this ritual and before, you know, if they couldn't get a minister uh, or there wasn't a minister readily available. But on the spiritual side of that equation, right, because that's kind of like the technical side. On the spiritual side of that equation, how does Jump in the Broom constitute with Christians of that era? Good question. So the... Um one thing to emphasize is that from its origin point, as far as we can tell within the British Isles, is it was incredibly adaptable. Um, and so this can mean a few things. On the one hand, some people certainly used it as a rejection of Christian traditions, but others also integrated it within what we might call a church wedding. So it wasn't actually uncommon if you look at even populations who lived in Britain to get married at a church house and then run out to the grassy fields and jump over a broomstick to the cheers of their friends. Now, this transfers over to the United States and is adopted by enslaved people. But one thing that I should also emphasize is that the custom is incredibly diverse. And as I mentioned earlier and kind of alluded to, there probably is no single way to do it. Um, you know, the most conventional way is that people turn around and they just jump over together. But I provide an actual graph within the book, which gives people like an, an idea as to how many different ways that I've calculated enslaved people use it. I mean, sometimes people just jumped over one at a time. Sometimes just the man jumped over. Sometimes just the woman jumped over. Also, I prevented myself from discussing this idea of hybridization because the broomstick wedding doesn't really fit within that parameter because when people talked about a broomstick wedding, they could have been talking about a ceremony under which they got married in front of a minister, be he white or black, or being a uh, elderly enslaved woman upon the plantation. That also happened as well. And the minister or the spiritual leader would you know, basically discuss uh, aspects of God within the Christian traditions, you know, beckoning uh, Jesus to protect the family, for them to have lots of children, and, and things like that, that are conventional for many Christian weddings of the era. And then they would turn around and jump over the broomstick, and they would see no problem in combining either ceremony. So, in many cases, it seems that the broomstick wedding was integrated within the Christian praxis, that, and the, particularly the unique version that enslaved people adapted for themselves, in which they very much appreciated the Old Testament aspect of the Exodus and the resistance framework that was employed by the Old Testament Israelites. And so within the broomstick being adopted into that version of Christianity, you see it within both the spiritual elements, but also the resistance elements that we've kind of touched upon throughout this interview. Well, I, I want to sidestep for a moment um, because we, we, we don't like to give too much away because we do want people to buy your book. I appreciate that. <laughs> Considering that you mentioned a couple of times um, for different examples, of course, the, the, the graphs and, and, and how you present things. What went into writing this book? How much information, you know, what, what, what was the process? How, how long did it take? Uh, 
you know, the, the putting these graphics together and quantifying, qualifying all these analyses. Talk to us about that. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, and I, I say this to not dissuade anybody from attempting to write a book because my, my experience might be unique. Some people write books much faster. But um, the reality of, of my situation is that I started thinking about this subject, not necessarily as a book, but just something I was interested in back in about 2009. And that had, and you know, if you read my acknowledgements, I, I go into a little bit more detail, but it happens really in tandem with my own wedding. You know, my wife wanted to do it and I wanted to gather information about it. I was requested to do so by the minister. And long story short, I mean, I was an aspiring researcher and I just started accumulating large amounts of research, very little of which the minister actually read. But at the same time, I had all of this information that I found really compelling. And within that, I was also going to graduate school. So I was thinking about what I would contribute to kind of this large body of scholarship. And that's always a really intimidating aspect of going into graduate school because you look at this large, massive collection of research that exists within the world and you think, well, what can I possibly add to all of these great works that I'm reading? And one thing that became very clear to me is that jumping the broom was a well-known custom that people knew very little about, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, and what I mean by that is it's, it's featured in so many books, particularly after the 1970s when people started excavating the cultures of enslaved people. You start to see just a multitude of references to it. But they were all very similar to me because none of them went into great detail as to what exactly it was. It was just kind of listed as this quaint cultural custom that enslaved people use, but then it disappears from the rest of the analysis. I mean, even the best books on slave marriage specifically often didn't go into a lot of detail about jumping the broom. And for me, I started to think maybe it's just because no one had thought to ask the big question. I mean, what is it? Where does it come from? Why did people do it? And so for me, that was the turning point in deciding that I wanted to pursue this in some capacity for my professional career. Now, I took a slight detour because I did write my master's thesis on this, and that was published, I think, in about 2011. But then I wrote a dissertation that looked more broadly at marriage rituals amongst diasporic Africans throughout kind of the British Atlantic. So it was related, but that took me away from the project for a few years. But essentially, when I was writing this book, it was just a process of where I would get really into a specific era of history or a specific theme or a specific group, and I would just find myself writing sections and saving them into like this long-term folder that I would return to periodically. But around 2016 to 2017, my oldest daughter had just been born at that point. And it was really just me and the baby at night because my, my wife is a uh, night nurse. She does labor and delivery at night. So she does the 12 hour shifts. And so it was just me and the sleeping baby. Well, not sleeping all the time, more, <laughs> more, more like not sleeping. <laughs> but, and so what that required me to do is to stay up for the office. But sometimes you think your best thoughts at night. And so I just was staring at my ceiling one night and I said, I want to write that book on jumping the broom. But that's the one that I want to write. Like I could have revised my dissertation. I had some presses that were interested in it. But I just I really wanted to write this one because I thought it was just what was piquing my interest at that time. And so long story short, essentially, I start like a daily writing program like just a regimen where I am, even if it's just two sentences for that day, I did something. But I started to find that the more I was invested in the project, specifically, the more it started to flow. And then you also realize how much your thesis changes from six years ago. So, and this is really what created this motivation to take the book into the 21st century, because I think at the time I was writing, the new roots came out, the revised roots or the, the new one from the new generation. And they actually have a reference to the broomstick ceremony within that particular um, rendition. 
and it's actually very different than the original. And I found that absolutely fascinating. So I just decided that I had to integrate as much of the recent information as I could to demonstrate how it's constantly evolving. And so for me, supposedly I could have written the book within a period of a few years if I, if I really wanted to actually, you know, get with the program on that front and finish it. But I'm actually glad that I waited because from that period from 2010 to 2020, so much had changed, particularly within American politics, that it basically the last few chapters that I have probably wouldn't exist if I had just decided to complete it in like 2014 or something like that. So um, you know, there are things happen for a reason in this case, as the colloquialism goes. And I think for me, the best decision I made was to kind of wait on the project for a little bit and then see what else comes out. And then when I was satisfied with the thesis and the conclusion, uh, you know, send it for publication and see who's interested. And luckily, University of North Carolina Press was very interested and they did a great job in getting it out, not just on time, but actually early. Oh, that is good, especially in the climate that we're in. You know, yes. I, 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 so I have a question about the broomstick, actually, because the one thing that I noticed uh, in this conversation is you, you specifically say broomstick. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, because in some of these movies, in some of these books, Sometimes it's you hear a stick, you know, not necessarily a broomstick, but but you're specifying a broomstick. So I have a, actually it's a part one and part one a. The the significance of the actual broom in this ritual, and is would witchcraft be any part of this? Because brooms are synonymous with witches as well. Yes. So the, the broad answer would be yes, but with some qualifications, as, as with most of them, I guess. Um, so on the one hand, this is a good question because it's something that I thought about when I was writing the book one day, because another aspect that I thought was missing from a lot of past analyses to the extent that they existed about Jumping the Broom is that the interpretation of the broom and its meaning to enslave people were really kind of superficial to the degree that, it, you know, there was a lot of suggestions about the possible things that it meant, but they didn't really engage the primary sources. And so for me, as I did with, you know, jumping the broom in general, I went back to a number of narratives of enslaved people and tried to see what, not just what they thought about jumping the broom, but just the broom in general. I mean, what purpose does a broom serve upon an antebellum plantation? Most obviously, it's a practical tool for sweeping and cleaning and maintaining a sense of a cleanly and peaceful space. But also, certainly within the context of folklore, a number of people associated the broomstick wedding with the supernatural. Now, of course, this is commonly associated with European traditions of witchcraft to where the drawings typically invoke this idea of a woman riding upon a broomstick is, you know, what the ancient, or at least what scholars in um, the early 20th century interpreted it as kind of a domination of the male phallus. And this is the great instillment of fear amongst men within both medieval Europe, but also the colonial period in the United States with Salem, Massachusetts. I mean, this idea of associating a woman with a phallus suggested that she was a person who is going to resist the system or who is not put within her appropriate place in accordance with the gender dynamics of the time. So the association with the broomstick and witchcraft does stem from that era, as far as I can tell, within the European tradition. And that is adopted by enslaved people who live in the rural South. Now, of course, all of this to say that there's also a unique version and branding that occurs amongst enslaved people as they're trying to interpret what these symbols mean to them within their own individual locales. But broadly considering the evidence, what seems to occur is that there were a number of people who associated the successful clearance of the broomstick with a form of luck. Um, and bad spirits would 
be avoided if you successfully cleared the broom, but also if you followed specific ritual motions. So it wasn't always just jumping over the broom, but the way in which you jump. I mean, I actually begin the book with, an, with a vignette that suggests as much. It's one of the more unique sources that I found. So I, I do encourage people to read that and, uh, and kind of see the conclusions I come to. But they're broadly conceived. What also is a problem for kind of generalizing the experience is the majority of people who discussed jumping the broom didn't often talk about the supernatural connection. It's like the, the conclusions I was basing upon the supernatural or metaphysical connections were largely based upon a small percentage of people who went into some detail about it. But many people, either they didn't want to reveal that aspect of jumping the broom, or they perhaps didn't know about it. Because I also consider the fact that people who perform rituals don't always know their broader significance. Right. And I think we can see that play out even within the things people do today. So I can't necessarily blame a person for not revealing more information if, if it's likely that they might just not have known. They just knew it was something their grandparents did or their parents did, and so they did it as well. But the I do have a section in which I break down the meaning of broomsticks to people of West African descent and how that influenced the decisions that enslaved people made when they decided to jump the broom. And one of the fascinating aspects I found is that broom making was a very skilled trade within the plantation complex. So broom makers and the methods in which they employed to make brooms within the plantation were very well respected, even by Frederick Douglass himself. I mean, he, he even mentions this in one of his memoirs, that the broom makers were amongst some of the most respected people upon the plantation. So it, that does suggest some significance if you are going to jump the broom and the broom is a gift given to you by your community. Right? And then you get to keep that broom that was probably made by somebody that was respected within that particular space. I dig it. And you, you mentioned something I was about to get to. You have a habit of doing that. <laughs> We're insane. <laughs> um, folkloric ethnogra uh, ethnographic question. So when we started this conversation... You shared with us of a gentleman who clearly said he went to a location and taught the people in this place how to do this. Now, as you're tracking it, and it's a little bit more blurred of how it's being transferred, how would you... Uh, is, are, are these informal lessons? Are they formal lessons? Does the grandmama sit down and say, look, boy, this is what you got to do now? You know, how does that work? This is a great question. One that I wish I probably had a better answer to. But as far as I can tell, um, probably all of that is true. Um, there was probably an informal method under which it was introduced and probably a formal method. So, there's a couple of origin points that I discuss within the book and as far as deciphering how it was interpreted by different enslaved people on different plantations. So it was certainly in some cases introduced by the slave owner um, who saw it as a ritual of mockery inherited from that elite British mindset that saw populations in Britain doing it under the same guise. So just as Scottish people or Romani people were mocked for doing it, certainly slave owners mocked enslaved people by introducing it within the community and coercing them at the very least to perform the ritual. So that also might inform the distinctions and how people remembered it. So for those that rejected its validity, which there were some within the U.S. South interviewed later that did, I mean, they would say such things like, we never did that nonsense or something to that effect. Hmm. It might be because the circumstances in which they were introduced to it may have been under that kind of domination, subordination paradigm. Almost On the like other the, hand, uh, Almost like the, those who subscribe to slave seculars, uh, that style of music, because they did not... Um, take to the ministry of those coming in trying to force uh, a particular uh, spirituality on them, something to that effect? 
Precisely. Yes. Okay. So it's this idea that, you know, some people just outright reject certain things because of its association with slavery. I mean, and sometimes it was actually dismissed as a slave ritual. Like that's what it was called from mm -hmm. what, I, what I can gather from the, the evidence. So some people just outright rejected it. And, you know, there were actually some open disagreements amongst the interviewees, sometimes who were interviewed simultaneously together, where you would actually see arguments break out between them about whether or not jumping the broom was a valid option under slavery, or even if it was performed. And so the third chapter, I believe, the one that I wrote, explores that process under which people are consciously forgetting the actual ritual and trying to actively subvert it within popular memory. But on the other hand, I also make the case that it seems likely that enslaved people in various circumstances saw people performing it whether that be a white population or another population on a neighboring plantation. And they just decided to adapt, adopt it because it fit within their particular communal needs. And then they placed their own unique um, cultural meanings upon it. And then I even make one statement or one case within the book that it's possible that, you know, the Louisiana Cajuns, who, as far as I can tell, don't really have an ancestral connection to it as, you know, being called Acadians coming from French Canada at the time, they may have learned it from enslaved people who were doing it in Louisiana as more and more enslaved people were imported to that during the expanding slave state occupation that occurred in the, about the 1840s to the 1850s. And so, you know, maybe Cajuns have some French connection to the ritual that I don't know about, but I don't know much about the tradition of it occurring within Canada when they lived there, but all of a sudden they start doing it when they move to the Louisiana bayous. And one of the contentions I make is that because enslaved people were doing it so prolifically by the 1840s and the 1850s, it's possible that a European population may have copied them to actually start engaging in ritual too. So all of this to say, the cultural exchange within this entire process is incredibly broad. And I leave basically everything open to possibility as far as like the origin point under which populations adopted at certain points. So with that being said, I think this is a great time to ask, without you giving too much away, where do you see this going in the future, this particular ritual? Yeah, so a lot of this has to do with you know, celebrity politics, um, popular culture, but also a mentality amongst some younger people where the narratives of triumph seem to be the most important. And of course, this is, you know, interpreted broadly. All of this is kind of con socially constructed within the broader parameters. So I'll answer this question by providing historical context. So I won't give you know, what I'm predicting away necessarily. And, you know, my prediction may or may not be useful in 10 years. But it seems that the ritual is discarded when it no longer appears useful for one's cultural heritage. And so one of the reasons, of course, that you don't see formerly enslaved people doing it after 1865 is because they had a motivation to embrace what you might call more orthodox forms of middle class ideas about marriage, particularly in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. It becomes revived when people start to mobilize a certain social consciousness. So, of course, black power, the post-civil rights era, a resurgent idea of kind of Afrocentric thought in the post-roots era is when you start to see people embrace it and even attach new meaning to it. So the way in which people discussed the broomstick tradition in the 90s and even early 2000s was actually a little bit different than enslaved people did. I mean, a lot of layers were placed upon it within the modern era as a way to meet the needs and desires of those who want to embrace their heritage, which is where we kind of get this idea of African origins becoming very popular within that particular era, despite the fact that there wasn't much evidence for it, if any at all. And so fast forward to our own contemporary moment, 
with the way things change so quickly throughout social media, it's actually hard to tell if there's even going to be a unified front regarding how people view the ritual. Because on the one hand, there is this aspect of social elevation to where certain black people feel the need to discard kind of stereotypical rituals associated with African-American identities, but particularly with slavery. But also there's a certain group that also suggests that things associated with slavery might also need to be discarded because that was something that white America wanted to use to dominate the mentality of enslaved people and the subsequent generations afterwards. On the other hand, there is certainly still a strong contingent of people who see it as a triumphant ritual and a way to honor those that came before them. So I see a split, and honestly, it's not clear to me if there's any victor within the, uh, the grand scheme of things within 50 years, because what seems to be relatively or at least relevant within the social media culture that we now have, which is amplify with even in the six to five years I've been concertedly writing this, um, it seems like as America is divided politically and, you know, even within you know, subgroups and populations divided within themselves, the way in which people embrace cultural rituals of slavery is also deeply divided too. And I assume it'll probably stay that way, but what side has a larger percentage is still to be seen. Right. And I would just suspect, considering um, everybody, I don't want to say everybody, that's, that's, I, I want to make a broad statement, but not broad enough to be a jerk about it, but the, the, the digital era has me believing that instead of a broomstick, people will be jumping over a phone or a laptop or an iPad. <laughs> well, well, I mean, we certainly attach cultural meaning to different things. And so whatever replaces the laptop in six, well, I don't know, maybe 20 years, um, the, the laptop will be a relic of the past associated with the ancestors to some degree as well. So, you know, it's and, and this is kind of the interesting aspect as to what survives generations. And so it's interesting to me that the broomstick wedding effectively dies with some exceptions for about a hundred years, mm. but it takes a pop cultural phenomenon or a series of events to resurrect it. And, you know, arguably is embraced to a degree that it wasn't even embraced under slavery. Right. You know, as you say that I'm thinking about a couple of films, I can't call their names to the front of my mind. Uh, one is actually what's considered a black film and the other one was a pop culture film um, that featured that as well. If I'm not mistaken, it was J Lo in that. I'm not sure, but it, but it was it it was a pop culture film almost um, in the you can liken it to um, Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts, where there's someone of a high stature. Um, yeah, I know exactly uh, which one. Right, about. right. So it, it, it is there. Was it was it made in Manhattan? I believe I believe so. I believe I believe so, and I believe that was part of that film, if I'm not mistaken. Well, not, yeah, certainly. I mean, but also I, the other thing that brings to mind is J Lo was also in the film I think called The Wedding Planner, right? Which is similar in that the man is supposed to marry a, a woman of means, and it's kind of like this power pairing between the two, and so. You know, marriage and kind of the hierarchies of marriage have always kind of fascinated human society. And this this is pretty consistent across cultures throughout the world. I mean, there's always like this elite standard of marriage and then what everybody else does. Um, right. When you talk about kind of income inequality in the ancient and medieval eras in most places, there really wasn't a middle class. I mean, there were, there were merchants, there were traders, but the middle class as we understand it wasn't really a known concept. And so it seems like the idea of how so-called aristocrats or elite populations marry always diverged to some degree between how everybody else married, though there were, there were certain similarities and But one thing that seems detached from this is the embrace of the broomstick wedding and that this is something that if you know, literate populations or learned populations of the time ever referenced it, 
they did it as a way to mock the people that used it. And so this begins, of course, in Britain from kind of a class basis, and kind of an ethnocentric basis in many ways. And then when transferred over to the United States, class still is a very distinct category within that as a way to mock one's opponent, but race is also injected within it to a degree that had not been known amongst British populations of the 18th and 19th century. Wow, interesting. It just is almost as if how <laughs> look at these peasants loving each other. It's just really funny when you think about it because you know it, it's so so many uh, great caricatures are going through my head right now. But I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Though I mean that 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 was, you know, if you really want to degrade people, you mock the way in which they love each other. Right? Correct. You mock relationships, you try to fracture them to the point where there's kind of this couple, this breakdown of couples and, and then community, because if one's marriage is not strong within a society that says, says to value marriage, particularly in the Christian tradition, that is one way to subvert potential resistance from a unified population of poor people who have everything to gain from overthrowing the wealth. I, I'm in agreement, and I will ask you this as we begin to wrap up, because you mentioned this earlier, the heritage wedding and how that plays a part of broomstick weddings. Yeah, I mean, heritage weddings are beautiful in what they convey about a couple's commitment to both each other as well as their ancestors. And so the most basic definition uh, that one might be able to make regarding what a heritage wedding is, but specifically in reference to African Americans, is it's a way to blend your modern marital tradition, say you're getting married within a Christian church or something, and you take pieces of the past that are associated with your ancestors and you place them within the ceremony. So a heritage wedding for African-Americans in the 1990s, but even today within 2020s and this decade, you might see, you know, a church could be a black church, could be a different church, um, a minister marrying in kind of a conventional Christian form, but you might see tables draped with kente cloth. You might have libations offered after the ceremony. You might have traditional foods, be they foods associated with West African groups or within enslaved peoples, um, <clears throat> culinary traditions. Um, you, so you might have all of these things associated with kind of black heritage broadly defined. And that often includes jumping the broom. And so one thing that occurred within the heritage weddings was essentially this blend of different African and African-American traditions into a single ceremony. So as people learned about kind of these lost traditions that have been uncovered through, you know, first Alex Haley, but also Margaret Walker in Mississippi and different writers in the 1960s, you start to see Ebony and Jet advertising jumping the broom and people doing it, and that kind of spurs, you know, a motivation amongst others, and then the Los Angeles Sentinel starts reporting on it. So the black press actually also deserves a significant amount of credit for introducing the concept of a heritage wedding for African Americans who didn't want to conform to kind of the conventional white wedding standard that was promoted by the wedding industry of the 1990s. And just as an aside, I mean, the wedding industry at this point was becoming a multi-billion dollar industry. So it's not even just like people were falling in love and getting married. I mean, there was significant investment within how a person uh, marries and largely embraced by the middle class. So it wasn't just wealthy people doing this. I mean, people went very hard to ensure they had a, a relatively lavish wedding within the circumstances. But this also meant adopting um, traditions that were associated with one's ethnic heritage. And so for African Americans, knowing about jumping the broom as existing amongst enslaved people in the U.S. South, that was often integrated into this broad category of the heritage wedding. So you actually sometimes might see jumping the broom wrapped in kente cloth, and then it was jumped over in that fashion. And so the broomstick wedding was very much integrated 
within kind of this broader contours of what it means to be black in the United States. And on some occasions, that leads people to associate it with kind of this broad pan-Africanist that eventually will lead people, in some cases, to adopt it within the modern Caribbean as well, as they see African-American tourists performing the broomstick ritual um, upon the island. But um, I say all of this to get to the notion that the Heritage Wedding still has a pretty significant impact amongst Black Americans, regardless of whether or not they choose to actually jump the broom. Like, it always seems to be a discussion amongst people, even if they elect not to do it. And one thing that might kind of tease potential readers is that the way that I actually end this book is talking about the royal wedding between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And so a lot of the uh, conclusions that I draw from there. But interestingly enough, jumping the broom even influenced the political commentary that went into how people discuss their wedding as well. Interesting. Very interesting. And I'm digging it, man. I'm, I'm really happy that you came back to discuss this. I'm happy that it's out as well. And you all make sure you go get you a copy of, of this. I'm, I'm still, I'm a little still confused as to why you're not over here with us in the folklore ethnography <laughs> section of things, but it's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm happy to be associated and happy to, uh, to learn more of the methods. I just don't want to encroach on anybody's territory and be a poser in this regard. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, you know, I, I, to be very honest, I mean, I would say that with the inception of this project, it was really the interest that I had when looking at folklore that kind of led me into history and, and trying to blend the two disciplines within this analysis. And so my deepest hope is that I was somewhat successful in doing so because Folklorists really have become my people. I mean, I read Zora Neale Hurston pretty vigorously these days, even if I've already read uh, aspects of it. And I've really enjoyed understanding the methods and techniques that are being employed. And I think what historians can learn about writing cultural history from folklorists, because I think ethnographers and folklorists were really the first to do it, to take culture seriously, even if it didn't seem important to the broader society. I mean, what Hurston was writing about was often rejected by both white America, but also people within her own circle of, of black literature. So, you know, it's, I think it's time to pay our due respects to what folklorists have uncovered for us and for historians to integrate those methods into how we write about culture. I couldn't say it better. <laughs> well, again, I appreciate uh, you on the show. I, I was looking. There was something I wanted to bring up, but it's okay because you 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 pretty much laid out the book, which is what's most important and different things for people to think about as they approach the book, which is even better. If you don't mind, I will link the book to this broadcast and of anything else that that that's necessary. Yeah, please do. And, you know, as maybe a concluding point, the one thing that that comes to mind is, you know, you probably have listeners that might be aspiring academics or researchers, field researchers, folklorists, ethnographers, musicians. One thing I would say is that I don't want this to be the last word on the tradition. So just because I wrote the book doesn't mean this is it. Like there's a lot to go forward with this. And so if people are interested in learning more or knowing how they can engage literature, please do contact me. I'm happy to, you know, sit on anybody's thesis committee or, you know, provide some links to some sources that you might want to investigate. Because I can tell you now that I read, read some sections of this book, there's a lot more that I want to know of some of my own conclusions. And so I would just encourage people to keep seeking. This is not the final word on the subject. I hear that. And I hope you all hear it too. And you've been tuned into the African-American folklore. So we've been speaking with Dr. Professor Tyler D. Parry about his book, Jump in the Broom. Let me bring that book up here real quick before. We... It's a beautiful sight. <laughs> You all know what I'm about to say. Read, research, but more importantly, 
take your narrative and your culture serious. Take someone else's narrative and their culture serious. Let's document and get it out there so we can get these true stories of the people. Until we meet again, y'all, take care.